Dear ladies and gentlemen, if I may ask for your attention, please. It will be a rather small circuit today, what may be due to several elements. One is certainly that we are in the Rhineland, and that means that Carnival is very close, and most of our regular guests will just be on this track, some of them perhaps. The second one is certainly we are still in vacation period of the university term um, and uh, so much the more I would wish all of us to make use of the special occasion to talk with the specialist in the field that I will explain a little bit more not too much in detail because that is your ta task and your competence um, that we may uh, make use of it, uh, this very specific occasion and possibility. Dear ladies and gentlemen and especially dear Alexander, I am pleased to welcome you to the upcoming lecture in the forum series uh, this evening, the uh, lecture is entitled Law as Culture, a Digital Project. Uh, Alexandre will provide insight into his research project at the center uh, and as you know it uh, is bearing the same name. This research project is situated at the crossroads of digital humanities law museography and places of knowledge such as libraries, archives, etc. So this may be interesting <laughs> for the museologists, the historians of art. So uh, some days ago this was discussed in another context, what the role of museums are nowadays. Why museums? We will see that later on. It aims to, to develop a digital tool to collect and organize the data produced by the Kate Hamburger Center for Advanced Study in the Humanities so that it can be utilized by cultural operators and reach a wider audience than our inner circle. Through its desire to embrace a vast field, the work initiated and conducted by the center which is based on the paradigm law as culture, has created a new path in the field of the humanities, as we think, both in terms of geographical areas that we try to cover and the types of knowledge that we found out. How can those data be preserved, brought into a wider data context, made accessible for other users, in other words, are we able to profit from the digital revolution, as we have discussed it with Maurizio Ferraris and Marcus Gabriel two days ago in a really fascinating conference in the Center for Philosophy at our university, in order to present, to visualize, or even to better understand ourselves in what we have been producing during those 10 years would be interesting. This general question might arise for any kind of center like ours, where pre-modern and post-modern, past-modern, sorry, past-modern elements of producing knowledge are intentionally combined. The rise of common ideas through discussions, new perspectives do not always materialize in written text form as we try to document in our series Recht als Kultur with Klosterbach. The same is true particularly for the role of the artist in residence whose contribution is not equal to the production of a specific artwork as such but also to the process in which it has evolved that poses problems for documenting. That is why I am particularly grateful to Alexandre van Oudgarden that he took the liberty and the risk to think about the recording of the think tank in the special field of cultural analysis of the law. So it makes a lot of sense when he will firstly remind us or present for the time 
two great projects, the Panopticon project and the Harlem project, that may be not so familiar to all of us. At least me, I had to learn a lot by reading some elements about those two projects. He reminds us several projects having tried to visualize research data to better communicate findings and to reveal previously unknown meanings that allow new fields of application to be discovered. One of the most spectacular uh, projects is the Venice Time Machine, which you know very well, uh, and was developed at, by the Laboratory of Digital Humanities at the École Polytechnique de Lausanne. In his introductory notes, he also remembers a wonderful exhibition at the Bundeskunsthalle that was transferred from the Institute, from the Institut du Monde Arabe uh, in Paris, following the destruction of heritage in the Middle East to Bonn under the title von Mosul nach Palmyra, eine virtuelle Reise durch das Weltkulturerbe. Uh, perhaps some of you have seen this uh, important exhibition. The legal sphere has not escaped the digital revolution. Let me give you two examples. Our workshop about digital families in a smart world where the question arose how in that transparent smart sphere any kind of trust may ever be developed when the realm of privacy has more or less come to its end. Only one day later we discussed in London the creation of a new network, Law and the Schumann where those questions of law in a post-humanist, humanist or transhumanist era was at stake. Only some weeks ago, our dear fellow Daniel Zimmer discussed, from a legal point of view, the negative consequences of data-based individualization, as I would like to say, for the bargaining power in contractual situations. Dr. Alexandre van Oudgaan is particularly predestined, I hope it's not too wrong, to treat those challenging questions by way of his intellectual itinerary. Alexandre holds a doctorate in history and art history. He served as director of the Erasmus Museum in Brussels, director of the Geneva library and editorial and scientific director of exhibitions at the wonderful Musique Rane in Aix-en-Provence. He is a specialist in the history of books, Erasmus of course, and new media. In the same time, he has in addition collaborated with numerous artists and organized several exhibitions. He has just completed a project around the artist Fabienne Verdier. Here's the book about her work. May I maybe pass it around? Who could be even a candidate for an artist in residence at our center? Uh, and uh, this exhibition attracted more than 160 thousand visitors. What is a lot? Alexandre has lectured at numerous institutions around the globe, including the universities of Geneva, Lausanne, Bern, Rome, Chicago and Toronto. Furthermore, he has been involved in different film projects, among others with Arte and published books with renowned publishers. Albin Michel, Droz, Le Petit et Le Grand Robert, uh, with 22 uh, images by Fabienne Verdier. So, this is a, has been a, a big work too. May I pass it? Do you allow? Okay. So. Sorry. I had the pleasure to have been part of a great colloquium at the Ac Académie Royale de Bruxelles some weeks ago and could learn there how fruitful it can be to bring the sciences of the book, that is, the old media in touch with the new media in a digital world in order to document, systematize, organize creatively 
our knowledge about a world that does enormously increase in complexity and where the Lumanian promised land of permanent complexity reduction does not longer hold. So, in former times, one would have called you a Renaissance man, at least uh, you come from a Renaissance period in America, it would be uh, the way to entitle your perspective. Thank you very, very much for being with us and being so much committed to our work in order to take our work as such as your field of research. Thank you very much and I'm very curious, curious to listen to your talk, dear Alexandre. It's a great pleasure to speak after two exciting workshops dealing with uh, digital issues uh, that recalled by the Dr. Geffard. And I thank the co-directors for this opportunity, not being a legal expert, in particular the Professor Dr. Geffard for the suggestion for this today, that I should not speak directly about the, my project for uh, this first lecture, but rather present the elements that go around the reflection before moving to the realization of this project. My lecture is divided in three parts. Mm -hmm. After a brief uh, introduction recalling the last digital uh, humanities project I have coordinated on, I will deal with the functioning of algorithms and I discuss the consequences of this operation in the legal databases such as Ovest's law of uh, Lexis Advance. And I will end the presentation with the presentation of two recent, uh, recent digital humanities projects in America, Digital Harlem, and in England. Prior to this project in Bonn, I developed at the library in Geneva a project on cartography and representation of the city, Geneva la Carte. The aim was to superimpose, to add together, the information found in old maps, the contemporary land register, photo and video documents, and historical accounts. Uh, all this gave us the possibility to mix this data to compare them, but also to come up with new interpretation on the city. In Geneva, I have also developed an augmented dig digital publication site with the cooperation of uh, four scientific editors. We aim to enable cross-reading of published texts by providing them uh, new um, indexes, new iconographic documents, uh, literary or theoretical writings that extend the reflection developed in the related uh, published books. In Basel, together, together with uh, Marcel Henry, uh, we, an augmented reality exhibition was uh, designed for the um, Historisches Museum Basel, um, combining um, digital collection and uh, physical collection and digital contents. This project uh, in this exhibition, uh, this project extended to the area of the city um, com um, where visitors could continue their journey mixing augmented reality and literature and finally an arm of a mobile project were developed by an Austrian uh, artist, Florian Graf, uh, floating folly sailed on the Rhine between Basel and Rotterdam and offering the opportunity of performances in various cities in Basel, Mannheim, Köln, Rotterdam and this uh, rather sculpture in the past under the windows of uh, this center. And uh, four months ago uh, I organized at the Royal Academy of Belgium with the support of the Katenberger Center and the Dr. Geffert a colloquium to deal with this project developed uh, in places of memory uh, which mix physical and um, digital collection. The term uh, digital humanities uh, become a, became a label 
in 2004 with this book, this companion to digital humanities work, uh, updated uh, 12 years later with uh, the same authors, with the new companion. And there are two main uh, currents in the domain of the digital humanities. One uh, is on the source side and the other is on the uh, interpretation. The first, was, first one is centric on the distribution and presentation of material online for research, and the second use computer tool to extract elements for a large mass of text data, the text mining, to establish network relationship between data, to visualize data, and to create 3D models. The second trends favors uh, discovery and interpretation. The digital humanities uh, are inconceivable without the notion of algorithm. The definitions of algorithm can be more or less uh, com uh, complicated, uh, like the one that you can see on the screen that I found in the definitive glossary of higher mathematical jargon. We can prefer a simpler definition. An algorithm is a finite and an ambiguous sequence of operation or instruction to solve a class of problems. We can also take the definition given by children in a class of Colorado to the physicist Aurélie Jean, who asked them the meaning of an algorithm, and to a great surprise, they all began to think an algorithm is a list of steps that you can follow to complete a task, and at the end, and the end, everyone raises their arm in the air. And the naively, uh, children uh, escaped this algorithmic anxiety that advanced many of us every time a computer asks him to prove they are not a robot. More uh, seriously, uh, algorithms are part in our daily lives to find a needle in a haystack in the enormous production of legal text. Digital humanity seems to have been designed to enable us to find ourselves in this scriptural jungle. The law was the ideal client to digitize text and make them searchable. Although we often forget the law was not designed and written to be automatic or made made computable. If you are searching online, you need to remember, as your uh, Vessler engineer declared, all of our algorithms are created by humans. Every algorithm and database interface is a completely human construct, and each um, and the search uh, and every search is a completely human construct. The research must view the search process as a human interaction moderated by technology and not as a technological interaction. Another uh, very, very popular uh, word when we read articles or books on algorithm is bias. Humans often think algorithms are constantly making choices and these choices become biases and assumptions that structure the system. For computer scientists, bias is not used in a pejorative sense. It simply refers to a preference in a computer system. But it's more complicated than that. If the search entry into a legal database has five terms, how will the algorithm treat the search? If the algorithm is strict, it will return only results with exactly those five terms. But the algorithm can be adjusted so that results with four of the terms will appear in the result sets. The algorithm is set to determine, to determine how close those words have to be to each other to be returned in the top result. The programming team decides which of the search terms entry um, automatically or not, and which tempt to uh, the understanding of the machine. 
uh, only the team knows which legal phrases are recognized by the algorithm without a uh, quotation mark around the phrase. And how many pre existing legal phrases are added to the search without user input. The research does not have access to the list of synonyms. They are or are not added automatically to the search. Bias is everywhere. And an algorithm or mathematical model contains equations, constants, variables, conditions, and assumptions. The choice of these elements can be made explicitly if uh, they are decided by the scientist in charge of developing the algorithm. It can also be implicit in the case of machine learning. Imagine an algorithm to uh, recognize a dog automatically in a photo. To develop this algorithm, you have two options. The first one consists in entering all the basic uh, characteristic data that define a dog, uh, ears, uh, muzzle, coat. There are, these are explicit characters. You'll soon understand that the task, the task is immense. The other option is automatic learning. You start by entering the algorithm on basis explicit character to describe a dog. Then you present it with picture containing or not a dog and you correct it in case of a wrong answer. After some time, the algorithm will have developed categorization character on its own, which it will then use to recognize a dog in a photo. That's why Facebook, Google, and the others are so greedy for your personal data. The more they collect your data, the more accurate the uh, algorithms can be. But what happens uh, inside an algorithm during learning? For each wrong answer to the question asked, uh, is there uh, uh, a dog in, in this picture? The designer signaled the error of the, uh, to the algorithm, which will progressively develop its own implicit character for categorizations and this recognition. The set of criteria grows uh, what is called neural network. The neural networks can become very large and so complex that it's difficult to analyze them to categorize a posteriori, the implicit criteria of the trained algorithm. The complexity of a neural network increases even more in the case of the deep learning. With invariants so firmly installed in the network that any re education of the algorithm becomes almost impossible. This is what happened in 2015 with Google's image labeling algorithm. This algorithm has been trained on a tremendous amount of data to identify objects, animals, um, individuals in a picture. Following a complaint for a user, Google realized that this, this algorithm could, in some case, equate black people and monkeys. The algorithm, we had to be trained for a very long time had developed an incredibly complex neural network that prevented any rehabilitation. So Google was obliged to disable this algorithm. How is information uh, included or excluded in this black box? For attorneys, learning to navigate uh, black box is part of the ethical duty to do comp uh, competent research. Knowing, so uh, knowing something about why you research the result that you did is a critical skill. The need to know about the input, the path that marks the way to re the results, only increases as the amount of work being done by the algorithm increases. The need to... Uh, a good point of comparison is the use uh, of IBM's artificial intelligence program Watson by the medical community. 
Watson is uh, IBM's supercomputer, which uses artificial intelligence and machine learning to leverage large amounts of data. Watson is better than humans at reading through documents and is starting to be used as a quick witted digital assistant in oncology clinic, but with a caveat. Doctor use it in conjunction, conjunction with Watson Path, a visual tool that allows the doctor to see the underlying evidence and influence past Watson took in making a recommendation. It's not sufficient to give a black box answer. As decision makers, doctors want knowledge, not technological determinism. And legal researchers need to demand, to demand the same <coughs> kind of transparency. However, as you will see, this is far from being the case. Legal database, database vendors are commercial entrepreneurs. They don't wish to give away their trade secrets. It's necessary to test these legal products to try to understand how they work. Legal database use similar primary law, but how is prepared for the algorithms differs by the elements of metadata, relational, or the categories of classification that are chosen. Historical notes can be included or excluded. For all secondary sources, the effect of inclusion and exclusion in a database has an obvious effect on search results. An excellent study by Susan uh, nevelo mart published in 2017, which he will only summarize here the conclusions, analyze in detail the algorithm functioning of the following six databases Westlaw, Lexis Advance, FastCase, Revol, uh, Case Text, and Google Scholar. Susan Nevloma and her legal team submitted uh, identical searches to the various databases. First observation and surprising. The result of a search is a result obtained at a given time. She did research in 2013, and when they did again uh, in three years later, in 16, the team found that the results were firmly different. Legal database change uh, over time, and the ability to learn from their user change to a greater or lesser extent. The relevant determinations were subjective, were constrained by the state of each algorithm at the exact, exact time the research, the research was performed. This feature emphasizes the database that have a large number of client users who add knowledge to the database without their agreement and without payment, <laughs> and as is the case with Veslo and Lexis. The language of um, the language of the database, if you want to query perfectly, is Boolean, with uh, and or not, etc. However, some databases choose to favor another language. Fastcase, for example, give preference to natural language <coughs> searching over Boolean searching. Natural language search are much less precise than Boolean search, but according to FASCA's uh, promotional documents, they are a good place to start if you are new to legal research or if you are delving into a new area of the law. Surprising. Uh, relevance ranking gives priority to the legal phrases as a lexis in most document are based on concentration of terms, or close the term up to each other, coverage of terms, whether all the terms appear in the document, prominence of the opinion, and how recent the opinion is. Because not all databases seem to recognize legal phrases with the same consistency, this may introduce some bias in favor of algorithms that recognize, that recognize more legal phrases without codes. Fast case, 
in the end. We have also some uh, legal database that combine some algorithms as fast case. Fast case supplements the results with foresight, an algorithm that suggests relevant cases that do not include the words in the researcher's search and results from and online law reviews and journal database. Rival, therefore, appear to be using term inclusion, term proximity, term frequency on the main result page, page providing a, a unique visualization tool to help lawyers find more relevant cases. Rival's visualization shows the top 75 uh, results based on the keyword entry. Even since Lexis Advance acquired the, le le the, the legal research startup Rival in June uh, 2018, mm -hmm. its plan has been to integrate it Revel case law visualization technology and data analytics into Lexis Advance. According to its about page, a Google Scholar aims to rank document the way researchers do, reading the full text of each document, where it was published, who it was written, uh, uh, how often and how recently it has been cited and uh, in other scholarly literature. A study was done of Google Scholar's ranking algorithm and the author believes that Google Scholar gives the most weight to citation accounts. The most surprising is now. Uh, Susan Nevelo Marx study focus in more detail on the study of four databases Westlaw, Lexis, Fastcase, and uh, Google Scholar. Rival was uh, by, by uh, Lexis. The rem remarkable surprise is to see that no relevant answers are found in the four databases. All four databases included irrelevant results in the top 10 results. 70% of the cases were unique to one database. Of these unique cases, slightly more than half were both relevant and unique. Each database has an average, an average of 40% unique cases in the top 10 results, and the remaining cases have a little overlap. Therefore, each database algorithm returns unique, relevant cases that may contribute to solving a legal problem that is not fully resolved by searching in only uh, one database. In conclusion, the more information you have available, the more sources you have to interview, and the more different ways of questioning them. The information available is enormous, but it does mm. not suggest that the researcher will be able to access it by creating one database. For an actual research problem, he is obliged to repeat his question to different databases changing the order of the world and the way he asks his question. And then he will have to combine the different answers received. There is uh, no way to account for the higher percentage for Alexis and Westlow and the clustering effect for the new world database provider beyond speculation. It may be that much greater investment in classification as concomitant legal phrases recognition, mining of secondary sources, and leveraging machine learning from user search history gives Westlaw the grid's edge. As this largely human generated classification system is the old. In an earlier comparison of the classification system in Westlaw and Lexis Advance, the human-created system in Westlaw had an advantage over uh, uh, Lexis Advance, largely algorithmatically generated classification system, that despite changes in each company's algorithm and interfaces, still seems to make a difference. Another <coughs> aspect is very uh, uh, surprising for me. Uh, 
The Westlow and the Lexis Advanced Classification System reflects a 19th century worldview of the legal system, explicitly embedded in Westlow key numbers and in Lexis Advanced topics, based on the system of Christopher Langdale, professor in uh, Harvard. This classification system, while not identical, follow a pattern that is familiar to anyone who has studied contracts in law school. It's firmly based in the Langdalian view of the world, where the subject matter is broken down into similar patterns of essential for formation, interpretation, performance, defenses, and breach. This view is a form of filtering for better or worse, and the newer legal research database may be freer of whether, what, whatever limitation that worldview imposes over the years, legal research have complained that this older classification system break down as new legal concepts emerge and may actually impede research. Over the years, the new or entrants into the legal markets may be offering in their 40% percent of unique case, something outside the range of that old worldview. They may be offering new forms of serendipity of in search. This study produced uh, specific findings of uh, the six legal database study. For results that return, the large number of uh, more uh, recent cases, case text, past case, and best law. The most older case is, is Google Scholar. The highest percentage of relevant cases is Lexis Advance and Westlow. And the uh, system that returns the most results in the searches is uh, Lexis Advances. Let's come now to the digital, the, the linked project data in the digital humanities in the legal field. I chose to present first the Digital Panopticon's website. It allows, to search, it allows you to search million records from around 50 data sets relating to the lives of 90,000 convicts from the Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court in England, to search individual convict life archives, explore and visualize data and to learn more about crime and criminal justice in the past. The period covered is 1780 to 1925. This project was designed in uh, 2017, two, uh, three years ago, by researchers at the University of Liverpool, Oxford, Sheffield, Sussex, and Tasmania in Australia. The principal investigator is Professor Barry Godfrey from Liverpool. The title of the project is uh, taken from the control system of, uh, uh, invented by Jeremy Bentham. The significant strength of this website is to have as its nucleus, not concept or history, but people, individuals. The seat offers law, justice, uh, justice a concrete vision. Even if there are many more theoretical parts in the site, we never forget that law is laid down and expressed to define a relationship between human beings. The site has crossed the different source of documents to write lives, more or less detailed, although the authors of the site try to be as neutral and as factual as possible in the narrative, the impression felt tragic. We witness human tragedy without decorum. Following the example of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's novel, uh, one day uh, in the life of Ivan Denisovich, I show you uh, the unusual case of a person convicted for the first time when she was 70 years old. Sarah was born in uh, London in 1808. The British criminal justice system was extremely attentive to detail. We have this photograph, but already knew a uh, physical description from the document. Stara stood just under five foot tall, uh, less than one meter, meter fifty. 
had a dark complexion, brown hair, and black eyes. She had two moles on her face, uh, one on her, on her nose, there, and one on her chin. The sight of uh, different tables uh, draw from different archive sources that summarize the criminal uh, uh, background of the uh, convicts. Here we have uh, very uh, short uh, tables, but for uh, certain convicts we have uh, very long uh, um, tables. This site has a very interesting uh, historical background section. And uh, this section offering a panorama of London and Australia which was the place of deportation of many London convicts in the 18th, 19th and, uh, century. Uh, the white European colonization of Australia provides a very revealing chapter in Britain's empire building history. And characteristically for British punishment, penal transportation involved mac exile, corset labor, invasion, dispossession, and genocide. The colonization was so inglorious that for decades the history was not written, and the site gave an account of Australia in the area of transportation. A very interesting uh, section deals with the stage of justice, policing, before trial, the Albany criminal trial, sentencing, pardoning, death in prison, and we have uh, also so interesting document of Jews, for example. Um, we have also the, um, the stage of punishment and transportation, imprisonment, execution, but we have also so interesting text of, and, and documents and archive documents about the, uh, the role of ships as floating prisons. Despite the fact that we are intending a place to all prisoners before they were punished, they constitute a form of punishment uh, in London. And for some convicts, they were the only form of punishment before their release. The majority, the majority of the convicts whose lives are documented in the uh, digital panopticon spend some time on uh, the hills. I show you some other photos and documents. This site also was so interesting um, and it <coughs> attempts to contextualize what convicts have to say. Their words were recorded in shorthand and edited for publication, transformed from individual speech into generic text. It's only by understanding the context of the word uttered in core that their full meaning can be assessed. The same applies to the voice of defendant. The use of text mining, for example, of the, the work in this site, uh, produced genuinely unexpected results. The analysis of the number of words during the trials allowed us to propose the following graph. It shows that the defendant's voice, the blue line, decreases significantly during the study period. The marked decline in the percentage of trial with speech text, the yellow line in the graph, reflects the rise of plea bargaining case of which includes no speech beyond a plea of guilty. And it's become more common from the 1840s onwards. This line reflects the bureaucratization of the trial process and the movement of judgment from the courtroom to the police interview room. The blue line, the number of utterances per trial, per trial reflect a dramatic decline in the role of the trial as a complex conversation. And finally, the green line, average word count per uh, utterance, reflects a major transition in the 
80 tenths and 20s. By this point, when someone did speak, rather than short interrogation, we get ever longer statements. In parallel with the growing numbers of trials where no speech is recorded, there is also an apparent suppression of the defendant's voice. So, that by the mid-19th century, when speech systems were getting longer, defendants were increasingly mute. Conclusions drawn from the kind, this kind of indirect evidence interrogated shows that the new 18th century courtroom created a new kind of theater of judgment. This was substantially to the detriment of the defendant and can be thought as a new special, uh, special syntax, syntax in which the bureaucratic control of the criminal defendant was placed at the heart of the system. An identical work of contextualization was carried out on the courtroom, going as far as making a 3D model uh, on the site. The impact of this site was so interesting also uh, um, with the, its ability to um, give us the visualization. Uh, to, visually, to visualize uh, scientific issues. There is a visualization gallery available, but also when we search into the database, the system allows us to create your uh, results and your... Uh, 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 it, it, it can to uh, visualize your uh, our results. If you want, for example, to answer the question, as, um, how did the most common criminal sentences change over time? The site can offer this uh, visualization. We have a, uh, a zoomable tree map, and this uh, tree map allows to examine the distribution of punishment change, uh, the uh, distribution of punishment sentences for defendants convicted at the old belly by adjusting each end if of the slider bar, you can focus on the sentences uh, within a specific time period and see how the distribution of sentences change significantly over time. Here we have this example between 1810 and 1819, uh, and we see that the, the sentence is majoritarily the transportation, but 30 years later, it's almost has changed and um, we see that the imprisonment and the regular, the regular uh, for the convicts in uh, London. One of the other originalities of this site, this project, there are many other, is to find new angles of research. Uh, two months ago, uh, the website was updated with the addition of two data set on convict tattoos. 58,002 <laughs> convicts uh, was uh, at, uh, in, this, in this database as tattoos. You can now search for specific tattoos and for specific type of tattoos on specific parts of body. You can also create visualization of tattoo designed by body location, tattoo subjects according religion, and the administration was exact in its description of physical features, <coughs> including tattoo. Uh, we can observe, for example, that the four uh, popular tattoo is naval, religion, law, and chivalry. And this other visualization shows us the connection between subject. And it will not be surprising to see that the most in love is are the most religious. Uh, and he, they added uh, often a second tattoo in relation with religions, with love. Um, the site also of, uh, offer, uh, offers a range of research topics, as for example, uh, biometrics. <coughs> it's rare for non-elite population 
to be described uh, before the 20th century, to be described in much detail. However, when criminal, criminals offended, 19th century penal bureaucracy was ahead of its time. Prison authorities document much more than just crime and punishment. The digital panopticon contents records that includes the heights, weights and edged age details of thousands of criminals. Together with health and life histories, these biomet biometric measurements, for example, can be analyzed to glean insights into past welfare. Finally, digital panopticon reflect on how on how to teach from the uh, site's data. Different pages uh, of this site are dedicated to the four levels of education from school to uh, the university. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail about another exciting project led by Stephen Robertson, Digital Arm, but I would like to tell you only a few words about it. The Digital Harlem website presents information drawn from legal records in uh, newspapers and other archival and published sources about everyday life in New York City's Harlem neighborhood in the years 1950 to 1930. Unlike the Digital Panopticon, the site itself does not info offer interpretation. It's a research tool for exploring Harlem. The cartographic logic of the site is DNA. It's the intersection of the map and textual and icon iconographic documentation that allow us a new look at Harlem and its people. The rich picture of individual lives are contained in probation department files was subject reported their activities on a weekly basis for up to five years. Maps of their lives highlights the di distance they had to travel to work and how often many change their residence. We can change all the, the, the characteristics of the, the, the different aspects of the life of the convicts. One example only. Uh, mapping nightlife in um, in this site. Uh, Digital Harlem offers uh, the map of Harlem nightlife, which includes layers showing the neighborhood nightclubs in uh, blue, the speak easy that become ubiquitous during prohibition, the, the speak easies uh, are the unofficial uh, bar and the buffet flat, flat residence in red. Mm. The nightclubs and the most f are the most familiar of Harlem's attractions. Described in a range of sources, the presence of speakeasies is also well known, but they and their locations are discussed only in general terms. Whereas why I own most nightclubs and speakeasy, and catered to white or racially mixed crowds, blacks operate the buffet flat for black patrons, without publicizing their location, thereby extending some of the privacy of the resident of the uh, residents to their customers. Making nightlife to help identify an unrecognized black response to prohibition impact on Harlem. The creation of place before flats, before flats, apart from the white, we appear in increasing numbers in the Harlem nightlife. Um, for my for my conclusion, uh, we can observe uh, during this lecture there is no single algorithm to solve one problem. Many possible algorithms can resolve the same problem. And the use of different algorithms offers, as you have seen, uh, different results. On the other side of the machine, there are human beings. Let's never forget that. So, 
we have to adapt to different ways of thinking and understand the logic that this person implemented when he programmed his algorithm. We must also adapt our methods of searching for the logic of these different programmers. Researchers in the legal field use tools that are protected, but locked. The physician managed to open the black box. They demanded the key. Lawyers must also be able to understand their black box. We saw that there are very different ways of restoring the lives of convicts from the 18th and 19th centuries. We can explore textual, iconographic or other elements. But it's up to us to imagine new ways of restoring reality or contextualizing the data. Our role is to add meaning by proposing different ways of presenting data. Visualizing, visualizing the data encourages us to imagine what, may, what might be useful to users. The Kate Hamburger Center has been fortunate to us a large panel of research over the past 10 years. The following map shows us that the origin is very rich. The themes are rich and multiple. The logic of the spheres can be for us a dynamic way for organizing moving data. The presence of different artists and the last work in progress by Maria Aichon should undoubtedly be a source of inspiration for a digital project. The activities of the Kate Hamburger Center have taken place, place without the establishment of a library. Perhaps this upcoming project is also the place for this virtual library that the various researchers and artists have built, both by their articles, books, artworks, were written and made during their fellowship, but also by the authorities they refer to. There are two figures, ancient thinkers, who accompany and enrich the development of the reflections. The Kaitenberger Center is a sheep moved for a time of a bank on a rhine. But we all know that at night it sails far beyond the riverbed, closer to the imaginary, in that deep night where the spirit sings, indifferent to the categorization of knowledge. The Kaitenberger Center, within the University of Bonn, is that place of all possibilities, where the wealthiest path is rarely the street light. Thank you.